Namaste. Welcome to my podcast. All right. Today we discuss something that matters a lot to a lot all of us. Most of us urban dwellers live a life which is kind of high on stress. We are constantly involved in this struggle to achieve one goal after the other, what we call the rat race. In this fast-paced life, finding a balance is very important. But how do we get to that balance? I mean, how do we go about finding that balance? We all have our personal journeys and there is obviously no universal solution to this. Also, we are in the midst of this fast-paced modernization, especially in India. In this constant evolution of our society, we are facing a clash of the supposed old with the supposed new. One book that deals with this in a unique way is Lost Wisdom of the Swastik by Ajay Chaturvedi. Now I'll let you guys know a bit about Ajay. Ajay is the founder of Harva, a unique social enterprise. He was honored by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. He's an alumnus of Bits Pilani and the Wharton School. Ajay truly believes in the power of cost-effective innovation on all aspects that will lead to value creation across the world, especially in India, and he supports the socio-capitalistic business model which he believes will be the driver of inclusive growth. Ajay is a voracious reader, an avid golfer and an ardent traveler. How I wish I could travel as much as I as Ajay does. Ajay spent almost a decade living in America and across the world and now he lives in Gurgaon. He was awarded by CNN and IBN the Youth Icon or the Young India Leader of the Year 2011. Ajay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Krishan. That was a wonderful introduction. So now Ajay, obviously the first question has to be why did you think about writing this book? So when I say why did you think about writing this book is what led you? I mean was there a specific incident or was there uh, you know what were the leading events that made you decide okay no I need to write something about you know that you deal with this in this book and why did you choose this name the lost wisdom of the swastika? So uh, so first of all thank you for having me on this podcast it's a it's a great uh, experience to be able to talk like this and this is the first of its kind for me so you know truly excited and uh, look forward to sharing as much um, so having said that you know uh, as you already read i spend a lot of time in the us and you know like a classic middle class indian the dream the great indian dream is to go to america i mean it was at that time you know either become an engineer or a doctor and then you know otherwise you're a complete like you need to figure out what you're doing in your life so i grew up in dehradun with with pilani Father, they wanted me to become an engineer, but it was very hard and all that. But then, the you know, going from Delhi to Pilani was like no really big difference. But Pilani literally blossomed me into at least stepping into the real world. So it gave me a, a good perspective. And then from there, uh, Pilani to US. So like uh, uh, you know, small pond to another small pond, and then you know this big massive ocean, and you start to get your experience in life. From a very different perspective, you know, th- th- this would be quite different from somebody who would have gone from, let's say, a Mumbai or a you know, Delhi or wherever. But <clears throat> in the U.S., a lot of things that transpired. So I you know, got into day trading. I was, you know, uh, I went in for higher studies, but then I quit that. And I, you know, got into day trading and um, you know got another job. And fortunately, I succeeded, made a lot of money, value creation in terms of money. Uh, during day trading in stock market, this is the dot com boom days, and then the market crashed. You know, so I planned to go back to the first I did, but then I figured out you know it's not really um, anything that we're controlling; we're just riding the wave. So, fortunately, good experience going to business school. In that, in one of the business classes, business strategy classes, one of the professors who was teaching us business strategy. Um, said distinctly, he says, you know, in the heat of business decisions, in the heat of decisions, anywhere. You do not get emotional, um, and the book that he's referring to is *The Art of War* by Sun Tzu, and that you know, of course, struck a chord with me because I'm thinking here, look, you know, I've, I've lost a lot of money in the dot-com bust. I'm here in one of the best business school, b- business strategy classes, and the professor is telling me to you know sort of not get emotional in the heat of the battle or the biggest of business decisions that you're making. And I'm thinking, you know, this is exactly what I was taught by my dadi ji, you know, *Karmandiya Vadika Raste Ma Phale Shukar Chana*. I mean, how can you not worry about the the pal, the outcome? And that is where I uh, started to wonder, you know, how I go and um, disconnect emotionally. 
And so I asked the professor and he could not explain no matter how much he tried. He says, you just don't get emotional. And he wouldn't tell me how to do it. You know, so that's been a problem in my life that people always tell you what to do. Rarely people ever tell you how to do what, the, what they want you to do. And so that is what led me to get my first copy of Bhagavad Gita, you know, which I owned from uh, Iskon Temple in uh, Philadelphia. And that's when I you know, started to read. Um, and I read it uh, cover to cover in about two weeks. And that is probably has been the biggest life changing event uh, in my life. Um, to have gone through the book and understood that a lot of the answers that we're looking for are already there. And you literally walk out, uh, or you know, uh, the experience is you you come out of it, and you know you're you're uh, forced to ask yourself these three basic questions. You know, who am I? Where have I come from? Where am I going? And this was the the starting point for me. Uh, of course, I'd been a little spiritual before, but you know, not not as much. And I grew up in a you know classic middle class small town family. So you do, you know how strict uh, most of these families are. You know, fairly limited outlook. And so that's when the experience started and I realized that this is what I needed to kind of go through. After this, the experiences were more around, you know, I got a job, so I got a job with a consulting firm, then I moved to banking, and then the heat started to increase because you know, I was doing fairly well, but then it came to a point where I was forced or asked to make decisions which were completely uh, counterintuitive and you know, definitely not ethical from my perspective. And so I refused. And Around that time, I was also going through a personal experience, so you know, I was going through a divorce, and that led me to a lot of experiences on my own. And uh, somehow, I decided to go to the Himalayas. And uh, in the Himalayas, I met my Guruji, who's uh, Maharaji in the in the book, and uh, <clears throat> that changed my life fundamentally. The direction, the perspective, the uh, the outlook to things that I had before, and it all started changing. So that happened around 2007, eight, nine. And I spent a lot of time there. Now, this is when I came back and I was still working with City. And um, then I you know, set up my own social enterprise, which was you know, around value creation, which I'll come to a little later. But uh, we launched the first all-women rural BPO in a Khap Panchayat village with Jats. Right? And uh, the experience was phenomenal because you set up something like this in your own country. It's a producer's uh, model. But then... The first journalist who came, and, and of course it got me a lot of recognition, so you know, lots of recognition around what you already read. So journalists then come to you know, uh, interview you, and, and the first journalist who asked me a question was, what kind of social problems did I come across in, in setting up uh, the venture? And honestly speaking, I had not come across a single social problem. I'm not from Haryana, I'm not a Jat, I'm certainly not familiar with the Kha Panchayats, but there was not a single problem in setting up this all-women outfit, right? My problem was something very different. It was that there was no electricity that we were getting. We were getting it only for four hours a day. And then uh, what I'd do is, you know, look out for what are the other options. And you won't believe it, the first electricity that we got continuously was from a Theka, right? Because in India, you can go to any corner of the country, you might not get a glass of clean water, but you'll certainly get chilled beer. If there's chilled, yeah. Yeah, you know, and so that was the electricity. So then I didn't have internet and I kept requesting, come. this is 2010, 11, Airtel refused, Reliance refused, Vodafone refused. Everyone said, look, this is a dark area. We don't go there. And then somehow I said, guys, you know, I believe in it so much that I got 50 dongles in my apartment address, right? In Gurgaon. Mm -hmm. And I took those 50 dongles. So those 50 dongles in my apartment address and electricity from a theka with, you know, women who had never seen a computer before, who had been trained for about three months. That's what got the first all women rural BPO. My disappointment was, sorry for this long answer, but my disappointment after all this journey was that the journalist asked me what kind of social problems I came across, right? So my thing is that in order to approach a certain problem, you need to first understand the problem. In India, especially in the urban areas, we are trying to hammer something in without really understanding what the problem is, right? And that was one of the points where I decided, okay, you know what, I need to explain this concept of what India is. You know, the way we approach is very different, you know? Just because a woman is wearing a ghoomer does not mean anything about her, right? It, it means something about the societal ritual, but it doesn't mean anything about her. So she could be capable of flying a plane, right? But you can't judge her based on this. So that was one. Number two, you know, I, I started getting called for a lot of talks of, you know, over 800 colleges that have called me, different events. Everyone almost at the end of it would ask me the same question, you know, why does a person with your profile is doing something like this? 
And I said, okay, great. You know, after answering it so many times, that's the answer that I got, a book, right? And the book had to be something which is fundamental philosophical basis of where we are arriving at things from. So a 10 minute answer for your short question, why this book? That's why. No, it's a very valid answer. And, you know, it's something very interesting that you mentioned about, you know, the journalist asking you about the social problems is because of the gaze of the journalist. And unfortunately, this is what bothers me. And I and I often talk about this in my podcast. I call, you know, I keep using this term Operation Olympics in this country. Yeah. And, you know, so everybody is looking for victimhood. Are bhai, panga batao kya hai. Exactly. Are yaar, तुम यार जा रहे हो किसी का बिजनेस मॉडल देखने उसमें भी तुमको सिर्फ विक्टिम हुड और ऑपरेशन ही देखनी है एग्जैक्टली दैट्स द प्रॉब्लम सेलिब्रेट और मतलब वो 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 ऐसे ही वो ऑपरेशन ओलंपिक्स बोल दो या विक्टिमोलॉजी तीन पत्ती बोल दो जो बोलना है उसको बोल दो बट इट इज बेसिकली दैट हैज बीन द आउटलुक एंड यू नो आई एम ग्लैड यू रिजेक्टेड दैट आउटलुक एंड यू एक्चुअली प्रेजेंटेड द अल्टरनेटिव एंड यू नो यू नो ऑल पावर टू यू फॉर दैट नाउ सी अगेन Uh, i come back to the book this book is a lot about spirituality so uh, you know anybody who goes about writing this book you know there's usually a lot of research involved behind writing a book yeah. you know you obviously you you mentioned uh, yeah. just now that you know it was the bhagavad gita that got everything started for you yeah. but so when you were researching this book because it's obviously about a personal guru experience also right. so how much of it was personal experience and how much of it was actually you know that involves reading a lot of scripture you know how hardcore research i go back i read this scripture i read that scripture scriptures so what was the research background in your book sure so of course 100% of this is spiritual there's i mean the only fictional aspect of the book is because 12 publications refused my book because of the cover and the title right so oh yeah yeah and and you know the funny thing is that uh, ms indu jain had actually once called me because they wanted me to set up uh, a a harva center in mathura because you know they have some social projects running And so that's how I got mm-hmm. to meet her, and then she got to know about these things. And so one of the things was, hey, you know, Times of India, can you publish my book? So you know, I got to know the people, and they said, yeah, okay, great, you know, because we've been, you know, associated, and we really know you. So okay, f- fantastic, we'll pick it up. That's how the book sort of came about. The change was that you know you write it as a fictional story, so it's not offensive to anybody, right? Mm. And uh, that's why the the whole twist came. But having said that, hundred percent of the experience is mine. Initially, the book was only about a hundred pages. they found it to be too short they said it's too too heavy right you got to lighten it up because this is a huge amount of uh intellectual uh, you know uh, knowledge and you know wisdom that people need to like pause and think and like like relax a bit and you know of course they were coming from the background of amish's books and whatever else that they read uh, recently so it's not light read that's why it came to this point so 100% of this is personal a lot of research went into it because what so i have you know having been or having been in india and i you know went to chennai and we school there as well so uh, a lot of the narrative that you find in the media today is you know 500% wrong 1000% wrong it's just you know they they're hammering in things which actually don't exist there are certainly a lot of problems so i'm not saying india is replete on any, any problems we have more problems than you can imagine but at least guys resolve those problems first by identifying them right you can't keep killing a problem that doesn't even exist and those are the things that you know sort of made me question before so i've read i've you know purchased the first uh, two vedas from pondicherry started to read them couldn't make head or tail of it because you know you're you're going in without experience right you're trying to understand mathematics without understanding numbers right mm. so from that perspective i read a lot then i of course came and you know started to research in the upanishads and you know what does that uh, the upanishads say what do the purans say and what do the kalyan say and you you're reading constantly but at the same time i was also reading osho right and i'm also reading uh, j krishnamurti and i'm so also reading j d krishnamurti and i'm also reading uh, sadguru right so lots of these things were sort of coming together the experience really was the culmination of all these readings suddenly things started to make sense which would have otherwise not made sense right it's it's almost the same thing as you know explaining a kid you know what dy by dx is and then once he sees two trains moving together or you know some kind of a acceleration event and he suddenly realizes okay this is you know how it sort of looks right so for me the the eureka the the uh, the the pin drop was really in that experience which got all this together 
after that of course i referred back to a lot of scriptures to kind of you know put things in perspective and uh, that again you know brings me back to your first question this is the reason why i called it uh, lost wisdom of the swastika this is the reason why i wrote the book because there is almost no place in india especially where you can get a source which you start things from the index the philosophy right and that brings me to my second book which is really about what the british said the british essentially everything that you find that the british sort of condemn mm-hmm. is where the answers lie so they condemn swastika that's it that's the answer they condemn astrology that's it that's the answer anything else they condemn that's where the answer is and of course we'll talk about it okay yeah so now i want to touch about this so and this bothers me if you say that 10 publishers refuse to publish the book because of the name i mean i don't get it i mean i, I know hitler messed things up for us and you know i completely understand the baggage but what is the baggage for that in india primarily if we look at a book the market of the book was obviously you know the publishers were selling and publishing the book for indian audiences i mean i'm sure you know no, no indian audience is going to look at lost wisdom of the swastika and say hi furor or something of that sort yeah. i mean yeah. they won't even know that hitler took up that sign pretty much but that that pretty much brings you back to the same uh, uh, understanding right i can assure you like i can give you a guarantee any issue that rises in the us okay this is the first time i'm talking about it publicly but you know i'm sure uh, it'll you know reach some right ears there is let's say they raise an issue of racism and some journalists will raise okay india is also racist and i'm thinking guys you know i don't think you really understand what racism is right the, uh, and i posted a facebook status on this right so white is a race islam is a religion and swastika is a hindu symbol or a you know sanatan dharma symbol it's a vedic mathematics symbol most of the times they've just like jumbled up the issue because they want to like it's almost like you know guys want to find a problem in the us okay now let's rep- push this problem down we'll find a solution later that's not really a problem i mean anything that happens in the us or in the west they'll find a similar thing so so the swastika thing is also to do with the journalists i mean any journalist that i told them about they said you know why are you writing something like this just like call it any other spiritual name so it's not like they refused they said look you know let's call it harvard to himalayas a banker's journey to self discovery okay i said guys that's being very apologetic they like said you know we we'll do it we love the book we love you all that is great how about calling it high life i said i call it high life and i've gone to the himalayas people say i'm a, you know dopey so <clears throat> the idea was not that the idea was to kind of bring the wisdom out in its purest form without being apologetic so i'm okay writing it as a fictional story that's not a problem so long as you know it says it's based on real life events but the thing is that people need to understand what the swastika is because during my and and i have like spoken at iims and iits and mits nobody really knows what swastika is right and i the once i start giving them examples they realize yeah this is the the real philosophy is that after you understand that philosophy then you move to like 50 other places you suddenly start uh, to make sense of things but this is what is opposed and now when i go back to the theories right so the so hitler might have done whatever he did but who's the who are, who are the people who really maligned it it's the british that's why you can't use it you'll get jailed you get jailed you know if you draw the swastika in germany so it's these guys who implemented who pushed that agenda It's the same thing with Vedic astrology, which I'll come to later. You know, when you have the other questions. Yeah. So, see, I have no issues with Germany banning the swastika because they have had a very horrific experience with this. But uh, in a way, you know, this shows the asymmetry of power when it comes to the English language discourse worldwide. Yeah. That you know, cultures that have nothing to do have their. personal symbols first of all hitler swastika was different than ours yeah. i mean i don't know what the fuck uh, happened there yeah. but uh, uh, even besides that i mean i don't care what hitler did i mean uh, you know the nazis also started using some aspects of the bhagavad gita to train their soldiers and then you know they really made some twisted understanding of that the nazis also messed up the darwin's theory of evolution what are we going to stop teaching evolution now to kids exactly that's the i, I I don't I don't get it. I mean, what do I do? If somebody tomorrow takes a knife and uses it for a uh, a murder, what? I stop chopping vegetables out of it? Yeah. I mean, Jihadi John uses Calvin Klein t-shirt. You don't ban Calvin Klein. So, you know, what's your so for my for me it will like Begani shaadi mein Abdullah Diwana. Or unfortunately, we have a lot of these Begani shaadis and we have a lot of Dunas who are constantly going Diwana or things that don't really happen. That's yeah. right. The thing is, you know, uh, 
I mean, see, I, I don't know about you, but this is my personal experience. When, uh, I'm born in 1981, right? So when we were growing up, the thing at that time was we used to have a lot of wannabe Britishers in India. Yeah. When we were studying, they wanted to become Angres. Now, the new kids are called Bandra Kids. The new kids are big kids. They want to become American, but they are the only ones. They are the only ones. Exactly. देसी नहीं कोई मतलब ये नहीं सुबह उठ के कोई बोलता हाय मैं गांधी बन जाऊं गांधी हर नोट पे चिटका दिया है हर जगह पे चिटका दिया है मगर गलती से भी गांधी कोई नहीं बनेगा एग्जैक्टली exactly. और अगर कोई चलो गांधी के फैन नहीं है सरदार पटेल के फैन है तो भाई सरदार पटेल कोई नहीं बनेगा शिवाजी कोई नहीं बनेगा कोई इंडियन कैरेक्टर नहीं बनना चाहता विवेकानंद नहीं बनना चाहता और नहीं बनना चाहता नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस नहीं बनना चाहता उनको यह अमेरिकन बनना एंड आई हैव नथिंग अगेंस्ट अमेरिकन आई हैव नथिंग अगेंस्ट ब्रिटिश आई मीन आई हैव फ्रेंड्स एंड फैमिली इन दैट कंट्री आई लव दोज कंट्रीज आई लव दैम आई लव माई पीपल बट या आई एम वॉट आई एम दे आर वॉट दे आर एंड वी कैन लिव आर लाइफ विद म्यूचुअल रिस्पेक्ट बट एंड आई एम ग्लैड यू नेम दिस बुक द लॉस विजम ऑफ द स्वास्थ्य का यू नो इन अ वे इट इज अग एफ यू टू दैम यू नो दिस इज माई सिंबल एंड आई एम ओनिंग इट सो गुड ऑन यू ओके नाउ दिस इज I don't know but I believe this question is uh, very valid and I ask it to every author so so it is two parts what was the hardest part when you were writing this book yeah. and what was the easiest part when you were writing this book okay so the hardest part of course was you know to be able to verbalize everything which i had understood and experienced and understood from maharaj ji in pure hindi and sanskrit right to mm-hmm. verbalize that in the present day context that was the hardest part to kind of you know go back and forth and i you know think of the right examples make it you know dense enough but not really very tough to understand so all those things that was like you know back and forth with the editor the easiest part was it was my experience so i have like no doubts right i mean i can explain it to people left right and center with all these experiences that's how i was able to answer the journalist in the right way that's how i was able to tell the people what what it's about why is it the philosophy and then suddenly you've gone and experienced it right it's like after having traveled the whole thing you can't go back and unexperience it so for me the easiest part was to be able to just articulate it the way it was so yeah the easiest part was really you know bringing the book out for me uh, i actually uh, to be honest i wrote this book in 7 days because you know in my head i had been uh, tossing and turning in you know like articulating these thoughts for almost about you know 5 6 years before i you know penned it down so for me the easiest part was just to get it out you know it was all like my experience i've you know known it i can read it like the back of my hand and uh, for me it was just like you know came out there was no writers block or there was no you know thinking what to do what plot all that everything just came out now uh, now i want to go into something very specific uh, you mentioned it uh, a little bit, little bit earlier so you wanted to talk about astrology and uh, i'll tell you why i'm asking you because see I mean we've spoken in the past over the telephone also you know I am an atheist or charvak whatever you want to call it so for me my life has always been you know kind of a third person perspective you know how the scientific process is you look at it from a third person process there is a hypothesis then there is testing then there is replication and you know once you have controlled and you have all the checks in place and then you say okay something is at the layer at the layer of a theory which is to me the most probable truth no 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 in in your book you talk about a lot of personal experiences uh uh, uh you know and uh, you talk about the chakra system but uh as we have already spoken about the astrology part now i want you to talk a bit about it and your experience of it as a personal uh, practitioner uh, or uh, as a person who's looking at it too so can you talk a bit about that so you know you've got to understand that A lot of people, and, and this this is the like really frustrating part. So I'm I'm an agnostic. I'm not an atheist. I'm not uh, a religious religious like ritualistic religious person. But you know I'm a, I'm a agnostic, right? So if it goes, it goes. It's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people would make you believe, and this is what you know really gets me mad. You know, if you're talking something, talk sense, and then you know give me reason behind it. Otherwise, just tell me. Look, boss, you know we're just having fun. No, we'll call it like a joking session, and you know we need, don't need to talk about. It. But when people sort of step on something, right? And uh, this is I'm specifically talking about Vedas, right? Uh, we've had so many debates mm-hmm. around you know beef eating and this and that, and you know a lot of scholars who come up and they say you know it, Rig Veda says this. But like mm-hmm. after I've experienced it, after I've gone through it, you cannot read a translation of the Rig Veda and then say you you know you've under, understood it, right? 
the the basis the genesis of the indian civilization the sanatan dharma is very deep okay so you you talked about it before and i'll come to it now so the answer answer is sort of uh, intermixed the india is to religions what america is to technology right mm. it is technology literally all the religions have come out from here right and that i'll i'll explain to you this is the reason why astrology is also sort of put down by the british because eventually uh, or the vatican or whoever that you talk about now this is not a conspiracy theory this is what it actually is right the the reason why the source is trying to be suppressed is because if you don't suppress the source then people get to know what the truth is right mm. and then you bring out the propaganda so mm. anybody who's talking about uh, let's say sanatan dharma or you know is talking about india they'll talk about you know whatever it almost seems like a uh, unending unbeginning ocean you're just in the middle of nowhere always right and that is what you know gets me mad because it is actually fairly uh, um sequential and it's easy to understand once you know where to find what information you can't just like randomly jump in anywhere right so you need to understand the fundamentals of things first so this is and i've written articles i'm not sure if you were able to read the science and spirituality one that i start with so the the no i did i yeah. did read that yeah so so you've got to start with the understanding that look breathing is the most fundamental that's what the sanatan dharma is based on that's it breathing breathing is everything mm-hmm. okay that's where pranayam starts so even the gurukul education starts with pranayam it does not start with a for apple and b for ball and a for arm and e for only it starts with pranayam because pranayam is the most basic thing right breathing leads to spirituality spirituality leads to philosophy philosophy leads to culture which then leads to business and, and economy so if you're trying to push it the other way around that economy will drive the culture culture will drive, drive the philosophy it won't right and this is where the dichotomy is in people's understanding of what sanatan dharma is right so as much as i respect american technology there is absolutely nothing to parallel indian philosophy till this point that i've read and i've you know try tried to read a lot of stuff the 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 basis where it starts is really breathing so after you do pranayam you will understand shwas shwas says samvedna tak and then you start to understand the vedas right this is the same thing that i said you know if i am studying mathematics mathematics is great but i now i can't claim to be an all knowing of uh, differential calculus you need to understand a different discipline right so the philosophy needs to be understood so with that after you get into the breathing then you start to understand the basic spirituality which you know sanatan dharma and you know so let me uh, this has been my understanding i don't think it's any different for anybody else when people are talking spirituality 99% people are talking about india they are literally talking about sanatan dharma that's it right because it's pranayam it's yoga all that is here right so after you begin to understand that spirituality which is for my mind is still sanatan dharma there is a principle of trinity in everything and there is a principle of four in everything right trinity mm-hmm. is you know brahma vishnu maheshwar ida pingala sushumna ganga jamuna saraswati right so there is a trinity which is what you find in a computer you have a left pole a uh, uh, negative positive and a earth right it's the same thing with you right mm-hmm. and that that's what i'll come to so why the americans are you know not asking these people to watch the sun because they disconnect you from the sun disconnect you from the moon and disconnect you from earth simple right those principles need to be explained first for anybody to understand what the scriptures are okay or for that matter mythology is right so f- from a very very l- basic understanding ramayana and mahabharata stories some mm-hmm. scholar might say they are history some might say look there are also like spiritual documents they need to so here's the thing right they definitely are stories right realistic element is there to it and there's a learning element to it mm-hmm. but on a deeper level they are astrological documents right mm-hmm. that is where the things start so the philosophy is swastika after you understand swastika philosophy okay there are four vedas there are four seasons there are four directions there are four stages in life but the thing is the second stage will only come after the first stage third will only come after the second and fourth will only come after the third you cannot reverse the pattern that's it and they'll keep coming one after the other they'll keep coming you can't stop it so you know summer comes after winter uh, rainfall comes after uh, before winter and this cycle will continue the day the cycle changes is when you are basically that is the flow of the swastika right so the the deeper understanding is in a vedic gurukul the students would start with pranayam then they'll start with their own knowledge then they'll start with a spatial knowledge that spatial knowledge is explained in vedic mathematics and it starts with 
the fourth dimension. That's the swastika. That's essentially where it comes from, right? So that is one. Then you graduate up to understanding of yourself. Then comes you know uh, the Rig Ved, Sam Ved, Yajur Ved, Athar Ved, and finally, if you know the co person qualifies, they actually give him Jyotish. Right? Jyotish is illumination. Right? So that's the highest knowledge that is imparted to anybody. And even if you were to study Jyotish for 120 years, you'd probably not be able to get in more than 20% of it. That's what most of the learned, most learned masters have said. Okay. So the principles in Jyotish are very, very uh, real fundamental, mathematical and accurate, right? It is this completely haywire, you know, bipolar understanding that the, uh, the, the, the people sort of took it back with and then, you know, made it even more uh, dumber is the people who are, you know, trying to explain astrology to the, to, to the world. And that is where it sort of loses the essence. So first, the philosophy is swastika. The key to understanding these documents is actually astrology. After you understand astrology, then you'll begin to understand the essence of what Ram is, essence of what Krishna is. So Ram is, I, I posted this, I'm not sure if you connected with me on Facebook, but and I'm happy to share that slide with you. This is in Brihat Parashar Hora Shastra, that it starts with this, right? Uh, and let, let me actually pull it up for you, I'll read it out. Um, uh, the, <coughs> the basis of doing any of these things is like for example the the calendar right now most of the people will tell you they're following a gregorian calendar fantastic so what is a gregorian calendar it's like before christ and after christ fantastic guys so that means christ was born on first january zero zero but they'll tell you look, you don't understand the calendar it's like slightly different as so, you know all that is part let's just begin with the week what are the weekdays based on and nobody will be able to tell you that right they'll say they're based on planets but fine if they're based on planets you had nine planets. Why have you named these you know, seven days after you know, sun and moon as well? Because they're, they're clearly star and satellite. And so you go deeper into understanding what that thing is. So this is, you know, uh, based on the grahas of Vedic astrology. Right? Now those grahas are uh, Surya is for Sunday, Moon is for Monday, Mangal is for Tuesday and so on. Right? So where is this knowledge? This is Lokavyapi. Lokvyapi knowledge means you can see it but you don't notice it. So swastik is also everywhere and you can see it but you don't know what it is. So if you go to a temple, there is Navgraha. That Navgraha is this. But these Navgrahas are not your uh, planets. Their Navgrahas are what the Sanatana Dharma and the astrology defines. Them. So Vedic astrology defines these Navgrahas as Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Sun, Moon, Rahu and Ketu. So there is no Earth. Right? And those don't appear in Pluto. Although they have knowledge of that. They did have knowledge of this. So this is how uh, these days are named. Now in that, the order of the days is not astronomic either. It is defined by the speed of the uh, Greha around the observer. And I'll come back to this observer, uh, you know, doer, observer and witness thing from your perspective as well. So the Rishi who's sitting sees the sun first and sun is the longest that it takes to make an orbit around the observer. It takes 360 days, but the moon is the quickest. So moon is the first day. Mars is the second quickest, which is why it's the second day. You know, Wednesday is the third quickest, that's why it's the third day. And similarly, right? Now, all this is actually documented in a scripture which is 3000 years old. So that's Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra, right? And this is what I posted, so you can check it on Facebook, but it literally reads like this, right? Okay. So, Ramavataraha Suryasya Chandrasya Yadunayaka. If you understand Sanskrit, right? Ramavatara Mata Ram is Sur. Chandra is uh, Chandrasya is Yadu uh, Nayaka. Yadu Nayaka is Krishna, right? Yadu Yadu Vanshi. Yeah. Right? Similarly, it talks about Narsimho, then it talks about Buddha. Now these things are references for you, but you gotta go deeper. What he is explaining is exactly what's there in the scriptures. Right? So Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra is talking about this, but now you uh, look at Ramayana. Ramayana was when? It was in Satyog, right? So Ram is Surya. He was born at 12 midday. That's why Surya Vanshi. Right? Krishna is born at 12 midnight. That's why he's Chandra Vanshi. But who is narrating these stories in Ram, Ramayana and Mahabharata and all? There, it's the Kal. You know, that has always been the constant, right? If you read any Yoga Vashistha, uh, 
you know, any of the scriptures, they'll always talk about any of the uh, Qur'ans, they'll always tell you that time is undefinable, it's an illusion, right? You can move it around. So, the, uh, the basis of uh, all this is Kaal. So, Kaal mein jo antar hai, Ram aur Krishna ki beech mein, wo Kaal antar hai. Wahan se calendar aya, right? That's how the western calendar sort of came about. But when you start looking at this, Satyug, Dwapar, Trita and Kalyug, these are the four stages. But then it starts with Ram, then it goes to Krishna, then it goes to other, other stages. So it's Ramayan, then Mahabharat, then Kama Sutra, and we are in Kalyu, right? So you've got to understand that the basis, the key to understanding this is astrology. So the 27 constellations that, there, that are there, they're actually physical constellations, you see them. You know, there is no assumption in any of those things. You've seen them now, you can't see them now, it's not their problem, it's your problem, right? You've got to go like higher up in the altitude, if you're sitting in the Himalayas, you'll actually be able to see the constellations and the the galaxy very, you know, clearly. And if you have a big enough pineal gland, and if you have those experiences, then you'd be able to experience the grahas in a very different manner than what you're experiencing now, right? Now, the, the thing is, all of that is actually defined before, right? So if you go to, let's say, pick Islam, right? Islam's uh, flag is a star and a crescent moon, okay? The star is believed to be above the Mecca, which is why they worship the Mecca facing in that direction, right? And the star is what they're worshipping. What's the most sacred day? It is Friday, yeah. which is Shukravar. Right? So they're Venus worshippers. They're Shukra ke pujari. Hmm. So Shukra chare ko aap refer kariye Mahabharat. Hai. That's where you'll start to understand what Quran is. Right? Again, very objectively. You know, if I'm calling this black, this white, I'm not judging anything. But Shukracharya is a Brahman guru or Asuro ki devta hai. Isi tarik se Brahaspat, which is Jupiter. Wo bhi Brahmano ke guru hai, lekin wo Pandavo ke devta hai. Right? You've got to understand from that perspective. Now, this is what is being driven down. Jupiter is yellow in color, which is why these guys wear yellow. All the you know the the pundits and everyone. The yeah. Venus is white, which is why those guys wear white. Okay, this is just one high, very very high, like hundred thousand foot level. If I go deeper, you'll be able to understand wh why I'm saying what I'm saying. Take Christians for example. What's their sacred day? It's Sunday. Yeah, clearly no. That's that's Christ. Because when you start looking at the the Da Vinci Code, for example, Dan Brown's book is complete propaganda. They, uh, what they've tried to explain does not exist. There is no historical basis to uh, uh, Christ, for example, right? It's an explanation. Bible is a very deep uh, biochemical book. But to understand it from the perspective which they've tried to show, if you look at Da Vinci Code, that's basically 12 disciples. It's not 13, it's not 20, it's 12. Those 12 disciples are the sun signs, right? The sixth disciple is Mary Magdalene, which is the sixth sun sign, which is Virgo. What's the middle uh, one? It's Christ, which is the sun. It's S-U-N, son of God. It's not S-O-N of God. It's the son of God. It's a concept that they're trying to explain. Now, if you look at those groups of disciples, that's also four groups, groups of three. You know, you can Google it right now and look at the, the Last Supper. That's, so, the Last Supper is basically 22nd, 23rd, 24th of December, when the sun is completely uh, on the surface. If you were to look at it from Jerusalem, on Mediterranean Sea, it will be walking on water. And on 25th December, what does it do? It rises. So what do you celebrate uh, 25th December in India as? What are they? Because the day grew bigger. That's precisely what is happening, right? So everybody is celebrating on 25th December because the day grows bigger. What do you call it? Then you convert it. So the thing is that the basis of all these religions has to come from Vedic astrology. Vedic astrology is from here. Then, you know, you go into swastika, you start understanding those spirituality from experiences and then you start to document it. So then you start to understand, explain it to people in the Vedic terms. They say, yeah, Vedas, Vedas are too tough. Yeah. Explain it to us in something, you know, nicer. So they say, okay, great. Here are the Upanishads. After the Upanishads, they say, oh, boss, you, you still don't get it. Okay, here, we'll give it to you in form of a story. What they are really trying to tell you is dharma. That's it. Dharma is what? You are thirsty, you drink water. You are not thirsty, you don't drink water. Simple. You sow an apple seed, get an apple tree. Sow a mango seed, get a mango tree. 
but the you know the, the human mind is very finicky so they keep asking random questions you know what if i am growing mangoes in the morning or at night so, you know they basically try to explain it in story format like mahabharat is one aspect of it but you go to dharmshetra then you really start to understand this is the meaning of it so unfortunately we've got stuck on the wrong side of the debates today we're debating you know why if a property could have five husbands why can't we have five husbands or why can't we have five wives or you know sita did this then you know the india is not a great country i mean it they're so pathetic you know we we're discussing you know it's like i keep explaining this to people that i i ask somebody a kid you know i have two mangoes and three apples and how many fruit do i have and there's a second kid who comes up he says you know uh, why can't you have strawberries also because you know you're not inclusive and i'm thinking you know, this is guys this is a mathematical question right essentially we've lost it because we've lost the key now now i have a question now see you made a lot of claims about islam and christianity here but uh, uh mainstream islam and mainstream christianity would deny that oh, obviously they they religion they their branding they are essentially brand they, not only mainstream islam and christianity in terms of their scholars would deny that even their adherents their followers would say this is not what we mean our religions are because islam and christianity are based on a very unique historical experience because if you deny the historicity you know historicity of jesus you basically drop the whole premise of christianity then there is no unique experience and if there is no unique experience there is no need to proselytize yeah but that's so they would actually have a problem with that yeah i'm sure they do everyone has a problem with everything why why do they have a problem with swastika that's what i don't understand every time somebody asks me this why do you have a problem with swastika okay great you know, say well, because hitler used it but you know it's not hitler symbol you know what it means they, they don't know what it means you know why, why is it named what it's named they don't know what it you know understand the philosophy behind it they don't understand it so what are you upset about if they can be the stupid to you know ban a symbol without even understanding it i'm at least understanding everything the basis of it and i'm not even asking you to ban it i'm just saying look guys it's a brand right i mean for that matter you know if you're arguing around krishna's 16000 wives i mean guys are you stupid that's a spiritual concept you know 16000 gopis are essentially awakening right that's the nerve endings i mean it's it's a very different sort of a format to explain it in so if you wanted to have a debate and somebody was asking you the same thing you know Uh, if ram married sita when she was uh, 16 then you know was he doing a, a child marriage i said yeah okay you know hypothetically speaking you're right hypothetically speaking yes he was doing child marriage let me you know answer uh, uh, the question in a very different way they fought wars with uh, uh, bows and arrows and uh, dashrath had three wives is that the world we are living in today we're not right so you got to change the context to change the meaning as well so my thing is that i'm not asking them to ban anything i'm just saying look guys you need to understand the basis of something and that basis is astrology it's as real as it can get you want to get to like the the truth understand what astrology is and then you get to it you know astrology as we understand it today is that 11 rupees ka aadmi who comes and says main aapka bhavishya bata dun so i mean what you're saying and what yeah. <laughs> the average no, no, consumer no. of astrology today has is very different so again see it's uh, you are giving a context and a meaning to something i mean i'm not disputing what you are trying to say here but what i'm what i am saying is that you know when you make these claims there is going to be a counter claim saying hang on you know i mean if you claim jyotish is indian but the first book was called yavana jataka yeah. and yavan was obviously greek yeah. so i mean so where does it flow from does it flow from the greeks to india or it flows from indians to greeks so there is a lot of things about that but uh, while we are within that realm how do you go around it because see you can't expect the average person to get nuance i mean people don't function like that for for them ravan ke das sir i mean i'm not saying uh, what they are but i met some people in life who who literally you know took ravan ke das sir as literally das sir yeah, no no they did not think about it as das gunas so i that's what i'm saying you know so i'm not even trying to awaken people all i'm saying is guys there is this thing there okay let it not die out i'm basically keeping it alive right i'm not shouting from rooftops right now telling people making claims i've been asked by people the reason i'm sharing it with you is because you know one this is a very unique experience for me i'm this is my first podcast and you know you seem like a fairly open guy so i'm not it's not like i'm going to be offending anybody and that's not the intent either i'm just no no see even if you offend someone who gives a shit <laughs> yeah that's also true you know 
So the the idea is very simple. Look, guys, this is the real truth. Now the the reason why I'm so against the idea of you know giving any credit to British is because they 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 were extremely smart and uh, brutal in cutting the roots. Today, if you ask somebody that, boss, you don't walk. Let me ask you this: Why do you take your shoes off when you go to a temple? Honestly, I have no clue. I just do it because everybody else is doing exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> ask anybody; they'll tell you it's out of respect. Like, yes. Yeah, I know. Plus, I think you don't want to carry the dirt inside because, uh, considering uh, at the time where there were no paved roads and there is a lot of dust, so there could be practical reasons for it. That was the practical economic reason that you're thinking today. But the real reason is this: What does Sanatan Dharma tell you? You wake up in the morning, you salutations to the sun. Surya Namaskar, yeah. karte na. Yeah. If with yogic posture, the other is physically absorbing the sun rays. You literally, I mean, that's what Maharaj Ji taught me, boss. He said, "You bloody, you completely worship the sun. So you do that. Evening, me, you'd actually look at the moon. You'd worship the moon. The whole English culture, the Western world, has made it lunacy. But it's not lunacy, man. Moon is the mother nature uh, element. Sun is the other element. So what else do, are you left with? You are left with connecting with the earth. So the moment you go to a temple, you take off your shoes to be able to connect to the earth." That's precisely what the philosophy is. Left, you know, negative, positive, and earth. <laughs> you plug your laptop into it. That's precisely what you need to do with yourself. That's Ida Pingala Sushumna, right? Mm-hmm. And don't take my word for it. This is something that you'll start experiencing. You unplug for three, four days. You'll actually start to experience, and this is what you need. This day, not me. Kya, you'll feel low. I can assure you, if you're feeling down, go down to your, you know, uh, uh, ground. Take off your shoes. Just walk on earth. Half an hour, just connect with Mother Earth. You'll be recharged. I can assure you, give it to me in writing. That's what happens. Do it in the morning. Look at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at this. I mean, I I work for about twelve, thirteen hours a day. I do sun meditation every day. This is something that Maharaj Ji taught me. This is what charges you up. आप उसको देख ही नहीं रहे हो and you're thinking, okay, I'll go great after a you know office. You go have a beer. Then you're thinking you'll be all relaxed. Actually, you're doing completely opposite of what you need to be doing. Right? But the 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 back to the basics is this. So the the basics. Of all spirituality starts with breathing. This is no right. My dispute or my point of contention is not who got what where. The thing is, look, guys, Indians never really traveled out anywhere, right? I mean, of course, there's of course record till the the Chola Kingdom, uh, the Maurya Kingdom to be up till Afghanistan and these places. But were they in a conquering spree? I'm not sure because that history has been destroyed. Right, the the temples, uh, defaced temples that you see, that history has been destroyed. So clearly, there's a part of history, or or you know, definitely is huge part of history that we're not aware of. Right. But having said all those things, uh, I know the Yaman Rishis, you know, uh, this has been read about. But all that mention is here; it is not there. You know. So the Yaman Rishis basically came here to learn something from here and then go back. It wasn't that they were coming here to teach it here, because literally all the chronological events of things that are happening is Afterwards in Greece, and it's happened before over here. That's that's the basis of the the Gregorian and the the Sanatan uh, calendar, the Vikram Samvat, right? So Vikram Samvat actually came 51 centuries before the Gregorian calendar. So in fact, actually 451 uh, years uh, before. So the Gregorian calendar technically was only 10 months. It was not 12 months, right? It literally spells out. So it's September, October, November, December. Sept, oct, nok, dec. The two rest months were actually inserted when the Greeks and the Romans came to India, right? So, so most of these scholars who came, they kept learning and kept learning and kept learning, and that's why the mention of these guys is in Brihat Parashar Bhura Shastra. Now, Brihat Parashar Parashar Rishi is ours here. There is no mention of Indian Rishis uh, in there, right? And and I'll take you to a different place. Whenever you can't get your answers in history, start looking at the comic books that are being written at that time, right? So you start reading, let's say, Asterix. Mm-hmm. Who do the Roman soldiers uh, swear by? By Jupiter. Yeah. By Jupiter. Jupiter is what? Brihaspat. Brihaspat. So our guru is holy. Brihaspat war. Isi lo the guru war hai. Ham. Our to Brihaspat war sacred hai na. So you draw a lot of those things by conclu- concluding. You know, look, that was not. But today the the Romans are not worshiping Jupiter. They are worshiping Sun. There is a fundamental shift in what they are doing. And I don't want to go into the theories, you know, because this would really come across as crazy. But if you start looking at all the rituals, British are the uh, astrology followers today, but they want to condemn it. You know, they want to sort of uh, 
demean it for the rest of the people because if you don't, you know, take it up, then people sort of lose it. But everything that you know of in the schools that they're trying, in the, the rituals that they're following is completely astrological. The weekdays, of course, you know it, uh, you, you come to uh, the rituals in, uh, what is Illuminati, for example? You know, the secret society, it was formed, I think, in 16th century, which is post-Renaissance. It took them about 1500 years to figure out, okay, this is what it is. So, Jyoti is light. Jyotish is to illuminate. Jyotishi is Illuminati. Okay, now I want to get into a bit of your social entrepreneurship work because I wanted to talk about that in the last segment of the podcast and I, I cannot let you go without talking about it. So, to begin with, okay, can you explain what is your uh, Harva? Yeah. And what are the projects that you have kept, uh, you know, basically done? And uh, are there any specific projects that you have taken over and that 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 have been, uh, you know, completed? And what has been the socio-economic impact of those projects? So, can you tell me a bit about that? Sure. So, so in city, one of the biggest things that I learned, you know, after having come to India, is that a lot of the financial inclusion or things or activities that were being done in New York financial inclusion was actually a very push activity and a top-down activity, right? So, you're trying to mm -hmm. tell people to get, you know, bank accounts open so they can be in the system. I mean, why would anybody want to open a bank account there when the guy is earning like 8, 9,000 rupees a month, right? Because the banks will charge them some 100 rupees of maintenance fee, then they'll charge some interest fee and whatnot. And the guy says, well, listen, you know, I don't want... The thing is that you can't ask somebody to open a bank account. You've got to deposit the money in the bank account, they'll come, they'll come to the bank account. So it's got to be a pull approach, mm. right? Technically, how does it translate? It translates to India, making India a producer's economy. You can't keep, you know, every company who's excited, you know, we all beat our chests up on, you know, these guys are interested in coming to India. Yeah, they're coming to India to sell you something. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, people get excited. Again, wrong excitement. I mean, Indians are stupid in a lot of ways. They're very nice in lots of ways. But this is what offends me. Like, you know, guys, any company you're, you're so happy about, Pierce Boston is not coming here because he loves India. He's getting money, man. I mean, for heaven's sake, he's selling you Pan Bar. You know, he, the guy got paid $10 million. So, the, the thing is, you know, you, you kind of not understood the value creation has to be, the globalization for me is to, if you are able to buy a Gucci bag from Milan, Paris, London and uh, Mumbai, then I should be able to sell a hookah in Milan, Paris, London, Mumbai and Sivan, Bihar, you know. Unless I'm able to do that, this is not true globalization, it's got to be a two-way street, right. So, that was this very thought process that I started out with. You've got to create producers which is what ended up, you know, and I told you a brief story of how it came about. And then, you know, the, the whole understanding of how uh, training has to be very different. You know, the, the, when I made the presentation, one of the women who got up, she was in Kungat and she came to me, she said, sir, I have to ask you a question. I said, what? And she was very keen to work with us. I said, you know, how much have you read? She says, eighth grade. And I said, well, you know, I don't think we can take you, but, you know, have you seen a computer, like worked on a computer before? She said, never worked on a computer, but I understood everything you said and I want to work with you guys. I said, yeah, that's really tough. If you have seen a computer, only eight grade, I don't know, but we'll see. So, anyway, I was about to leave and she said, sir, before you leave, I have to ask you a question. I said, yeah, ask. And she looks at the keyboard. She says, yeah, you know, in our school, we were taught A, B, C, D, but on your computer, you have Q, W, R, T, R. How is that? I'm a computer engineer. I had no answer at that time. That's what stumped me, right? Finally, I let her sort of uh, work on the computer. I said, you know, just because I don't have an answer, so please feel free to work on the computer and we'll come back and, you know, talk. So, I went out and came back after about 4 hours and this woman is beaming and I, you know, I'm looking at her. She says, sir, I have to tell you I said, yeah, sure. And she starts reciting the keyboard, right, Q-W-E-R-T-Y-U-I-O-P and I still can't recite the keyboard but she did. The point is that was my Eureka moment. Here's a woman who's never seen a computer, only studied till 8th grade and she can recite a computer keyboard 4 hours after having seen it, right. For me, this was wow. And then I got these, you know, about 500 odd women. So we trained these women and, and we realized for us, studying computers was Charles Babbage, the father of computers. Then there was x86, then there's 386, then there's a you know, Windows, then there's an Apple. None of that mattered to that woman, right? All that mattered was the tool and what the job was. You fix these two things up, you suddenly compress the learning curve and you suddenly start creating value. So we had 50 women ready in about three months to work on jobs on a device they had, you know, seen very little of before and in, in a work that they had never seen of before. So, we did stuff like business card digitization with these women typing faster than most of the people I've seen in urban India, right? 
for me that was innovation okay that is what created the first impact so you i mean this is of course 6 years ago so it's very different now right so that was the first project then we got you know gradually with the news uh, releases with the articles that were released you know the state government got in touch with us so we did you know work with the annual husbandry census data uh, creation then we worked with some telecom companies and we worked with you know a couple of data entry companies in the uk we started you know verifying ads for these guys so lots of different experiences right and then you know gradually i started realizing look the the, the company is great but eventually the business here for me is uh the competitive edge for me is only my pricing you know the, the everyone might be very you know happy and they might clap because you're doing great social service you're doing women empowerment and all that although i've never claimed that i'm doing women empowerment right harva itself stands for harnessing value of rural india it does not spell women empowerment or poverty alleviation and that's where i come i come in with you know spirituality karma ne vaade kar aise maaple ch kara chala i'm doing value creation women empowerment is happening i'm doing value creation poverty alleviation is happening right mm-hmm. so gradually anybody would say look boss all this stuff you're doing is fascinating but you know let me just be you know giving you business because you're giving me the right prices so every quarter i'll come back with how do you lower the prices so gradually i you know altered the business model modified it to serving the business through our partners right so the partners are typically about two levels lower than where you are and now these guys can actually take the cost further down so it's good for them it's good for us it's good for the client so we've basically expanded to partners across 14 states okay and so that's one of the things the other thing that started to then you know come about of course i was working on the book the book came out the book has like really been a uh, uh, success in terms of reaching the right people uh mr amitabh khan liked it uh, you know niti aayog is technically you know ready to kind of uh, look at us from a very credible perspective uh, on what i'm trying to do in kotelia fellowship and kulhar economy right so the pitch was always how can we create producers and not consumers alone So from a Harva, the XPO that I started, that's you know creating value, right? So it's got about 600 odd women we've employed, and I I don't want to get into you know the the very specific questions on what the woman uses the income for. Look, I don't really want to get into that. Whether she buys lipsticks or you know whether she pays for kids' education, I want to let people maintain their dignity, right? Uh, she can go and throw the six thousand bucks away for all I care, but you know our thing was value creation, and in 90% of the cases, a mother will always feed her kids. Right, so that's I think has been good. So that's that in terms of the XPO. Now coming to the book, the book was then adopted by a couple of MBA schools as a reference book for business philosophy and business strategy. <clears throat> and those business schools then started to speak with me, and uh, they realized that everything that I'm taking, talking in terms of value creation and grassroots up value creation, uh, has to be documented in the right way. So we ended up formulating a course which is called the Kolar Economy. Right, so Kolar Economy is now a 30-hour free credit course, which is now being uh, you know approved by AICT as being offered across. Uh, you know, we just completed one run today, and it's being offered across four other MBA colleges across the country. Right, so, that's nice. Right, so the intent is to kind of scale that up, because the biggest thing which I heard the feedback from all the teachers is they genuinely feel they're lying to the students. You know, you study a Maslow's hierarchy in college. and you have absolutely no correlation of that in you know, the economy that you're really working in they study you know uh, quarters five forces they study uh, marketing and none of that is applicable here because india is a very different country right you need to understand it from india's perspective not from like some bipolar perspective and so that has been a you know very gratifying thing the the broader aspect of this is now the cotillia fellowship which is what you know brings me in connect with you that if we can't give the rich philosophy that we have to the students and the youth out there there is really no point in us calling it rich anymore right so i might say well you know we have great great vedas and great wisdom great philosophy okay fantastic tell me what it is you can't explain it right? so the idea of cotillia fellowship was to engage with youth in terms of real today's economy and business issues and also be able to correlate that to our wisdom and philosophy that you're so proud of that is what my social aspects now has there been any uh, you know any problem associated from the babudam when you have gone about working this because uh, in a the desh as mahan as ours when and I, and i speak as someone who's actually involved in working in villages myself and 
yeah i i actually work with two villages uh, they are 120 kilometers away from my current residence and my experience is the bureaucracy uh, obviously i i i i have a different approach when i work in villages i am actually just looking at uh, you know working along with the sansad adarsh gram yojana so i uh, i work with a member of parliament and you know the villages are you know allotted to the members of parliament and they're supposed to develop the villages and i help them in that process and you know there goes about my experience till now is that uh, the bureaucracy in india is so slow it's actually if there was ever a case for libertarianism it would be india yeah i mean uh, uh, so what has been your experience working in rural india so obviously you're doing it in, in a completely different realm you're doing it in a private entrepreneurial realm but obviously you have to deal with the government so what has been your experience in dealing with the government as of now see the okay fortunately i'm not dealt a whole lot of the government so i've not really had to deal with the government right? so i'm not you're lucky yeah, i'm, I'm I've had, in fact, a very positive experience. Uh, incident, oh, nice. you know, Dr. Kiran Bedi Farm is uh, very close to where we had our first center. You know, they invited me. So, Dr. Kiran Bedi invited me as a guest of honor, right? And so, I ended up going there. And you know, the journalist asked me, "Yeah, this is Dr. Kiran Bedi. Who's your guest of honor?" <laughs> That was kind of a funny thing. <laughs> and yet, standing there, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed, you know, because, uh, so you know, fortunately, that's what the experience was. But anyway, having said that. Uh, shortly after that, I think by virtue of that event uh, incident, the district commissioner called me. He said, "Yeah, you are doing fantastic work." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, you know, why are people complaining about government of India? The problem is with us. You know, there's such a nice." He says, "Yeah, we can give you up to five crore in funding, but you please, you know, take care of this district." And thinking, "Yeah, these are the bureaucrats, right? I mean, this guy is like personally calling me. He has no idea. I mean, I had no idea of who I was, but you know, here's the journalist. Here, this, you know, I'm being honored. So I must have done something like cracking up, right?" The thing is that my experience has always been very good. Now he gave me a list. He says, "Look, these are the villages. This is the list. There's some three lakh odd people. Or you go and identify these people and get them on board, and we'll pay you for it." I said, "Fantastic!" And I'm not kidding you. We could not because of Dr. Kiran Bedi. So I, you know, got some people there as well. We could not get a single person to come and uh, train with us. And I'm wondering why. Right? So I'm like talking to the people. He said, "Sir, you know, BPL ki list hai, below poverty line." जो इस लिस्ट में है ना वो उनके पास कम से कम दो गाड़िया एक ट्रक और एक फ्लैट है गुड़गांव में तो आपसे तो ऊंचा ही हो ठीक है और जो एक्चुअली बीपीएल है उसको पता ही नहीं कि येलो कार्ड है क्या ये छह सात साल पहले की बात है चैलेंज इन इंडिया इज दर लॉर्ड ऑफ थिंग्स एट यू नॉट इन अवेयर ऑफ राइट एंड द सरकार वर्क इन वेरी ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट You know, you might tell me your name is Kushal Mehra. Fifty other people might tell me your name is Kushal Mehra, but your name is not Kushal Mehra until it is on the driver's license, which is provided by the government. So it's a catch twenty-two, right? This is what the Indian ecosystem, which I have realized, right? So for me, the experience was like I don't even know what part to get you help on, right? So wherever I've got help is where they've called me. Fortunately, I've never really had to approach. Couple of times when I did really want to do it. Uh, like today, you know, you've just uh, sort of partnered with uh, IGNCA for you know, something I'm setting up for the uh, Vedic festival. They're very open, mm. right? So uh, my experience actually has been either complete inexperience, and then the experience uh, turns out to be you know extremely good, to never really wanting to you know avail any help. So I have not really gone anywhere. That's interesting. So. now before we end the podcast i i can't let you go without answering this question so what's next so what are you looking at what lies ahead for you say five years down the line what do you have in mind in terms of your you know in terms of your projects or in terms of your writing is there anything new coming up or you know can you tell the listeners a bit about something that you're working on yeah sure so one is of course the the non fiction piece which is you know on the entrepreneurs and the kolhar economy The book itself is going to be called Kolhar Economy. That's something that uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant is also quite excited about. He's already sort of committed to uh, it. So that's the non-fiction book, but it's really going to have real on-ground businesses, real on-ground issues, case studies around it, and you know uh, how to solve those problems. So these are being you know dealt with the premium, uh, premier MBA schools and their students, and the you know MBA schools then end up having our own case studies. That's the classic one, right? I've gone to Wharton, I've you know, studied. Uh, case studies on Mercedes and BMWs and whatnot, but you know, in India we couldn't even save the Sun Motors. My my point with this whole thing was, guys, let's start looking at our problems to solve our problems. 
you know what the journalist tells me is not my problem i don't know what my problem is that's my problem in business that's my problem in society so let me fix it that's the the broad uh, premise of this one uh, that's the, this one the second book is uh, you know uh, sort of a sequel to the lost with the swastika because you know eventually the next after that like i mentioned the sequel for its breadth spirituality philosophy culture and then business right so this the second book is going to be more around culture and philosophy the first one is around spirituality right so i've, I've been thinking of different names one name could have been you know brahmins the real muslims or uh, you know it can be multiple other ones but you know it's going to be uh, hopefully an interesting one because we really draw these parallels and analogies which you've not really heard of before and that without offending anybody without really uh, uh, banning anything it just brings out a new perspective well that might light somebody's ass on fire that's all i can say but uh, listen ajay thanks a lot for uh, doing this i really had a good time and uh, guys uh, everyone who's going to listen to this podcast i'm going to leave a link to ajay's book in the description of the podcast go ahead buy it uh, it's a fun read you'll actually have a good time and the thing about uh, the book is it's not actually not a, a very heavy read you'll you can finish it off at a very leisurely place so once again ajay thanks a lot for doing thanks this so man thanks so much buddy appreciate it